show, guys. Good evening, everybody. Welcome, welcome, and welcome. We are here on a, a very historic occasion, celebrating 20 years of the fantastic work of the 100 Black Men of London. Those of you who are accustomed to being with us on our platform every bi-weekly Friday, uh, you will obviously know my partner in crime, Debbie Enno. Not literally, but hi, how you doing, Debbie? <laughs> hi, 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 Tony. Hi, everybody. Hi, Ebony and Chris. Hi. Hey, hi. hi. So, yeah, today we're joined by two other prominent uh, members of the uh, 100 Black Men of London Education Pillar, Chris Cummings and Ebony Coward. How are you guys doing? Great. Yeah, great. Really great. Thank you very much for joining us this Friday. Um, we've got a few a full show tonight, so we are going an extended two-hour edition of the Education Talks. Um, to start the show, we're going to be looking at some of the marvellous work that The 100 has done um, over the 20 years that the organisation has been going. And for that um, review, I've got a very special guest, a former president of The 100 in Mr Dunstan Crevel. And we're also going to be talking to his daughter, the beautiful Vanessa Gravel, about her time as a mentor, as sorry, a mentee um, for 10 years with the 100. And she's now studying at Cambridge University. So without further delay, let's bring in Dunstan and Vanessa. Oh, sorry, Tony. Tony. Yeah. Sorry, can we have um, Chris and Ebony introducing themselves, please? Yeah, for Ooh. sure. <laughs> Hi. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ebony, um, I'm a final year undergrad at the University of Edinburgh and soon to be a medical student. Um, I joined the 100 a year ago as part of the education team so I thought it would be a good way to kind of develop my skills and get involved with kind of helping young people and yeah it's been a great time so far. Thank you. Great. Great. Hi, I'm Chris Cummins, and uh, I've been with The 100 just for about a year now. And again, like Ebony, I really wanted to uh, sharpen my skills. I run a training company, which is a global training company. So I'm, I'm an educator of adults across the world. However, you know, uh, everything begins at home. So uh, that's a key thing for me, working with the community now. So there we go. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chris and Ebony. So, as I was saying, let's uh, bring in our special guest for the first hour of the show. We're going to be reviewing, as I said, um, the previous 20 years of the existence of the 100 Black Men of London, which, of course, is a chapter of the 100 Black Men of America, which is actually now 51 years old, I believe. Uh, and um, Yeah. So we'll be uh, talking to Dunstan and Vanessa about their time with the organization. So. Mike, if you want to bring those guys in. Hi, everyone. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, hello, Vanessa. Hi, Vanessa. Where oh. is he? Where is he? Is he gone? Is he gone and got himself some some new fancy garment? Because I know your dad, Vanessa, is he's, he's <laughs> got to be one of the most dapper gentleman that I ever know. I mean, 
The guy, yeah. he never wears the same garment twice. <laughs> you always, I think he has his sources. Um, <laughs> he gets it, it's a ship tow bar, especially when just... There he is. I can assure you. Hey, Dunstan, how are you doing? Hi, Dunstan. Yeah, yeah we can hear you. Okay, we've got a little bit of screen freeze, but we can hear you. Yeah, screen freeze. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks. How are you guys doing? Yeah, doing very great. Well, thank you. So we're going to be talking to, uh, first and foremost, Dunstan. Um, just give us a little bit of a background about yourself, Dunstan, and, you know, how you got involved with the 100 and, 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 and you know, just... Blur for a little while. <laughs> Okie dokie. Well, I um, bumped into Ken Barnes. It's an organisation called the EPN, which is the Economic. Oh. Getting a bit of freeze. You're frozen, Dunstan. I don't know if you've got a better place for your... Sorry, internet. I was saying okay. I bumped into Ken Barnes. Is that, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll start again, shall I? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> so, yeah, my background. <laughs> As I was saying, Ken Barnes came along to the Executive and Professionals Network, mentioned the organisation. I went... <clears throat> To long, like okay, Dawson, we we we're having yeah. a bit of a problem with your audio and your sound. All right, the sound and your vision that mm. literally sounds very rough, mm. robotic, and we're missing out some of your words. I don't know if you're able to um, yeah. get closer to your router or. If in the background, Mike, there's, there's something that we can do to help. Yeah, let me, let me do that, all right? Give me okay. two minutes. Switch me off. Okay. I'll, so I'll I'm going to move location. on to Vanessa and say hi, Vanessa. Hi. Uh, hi uh. So I'm, I, I guess um, you can fill in a bit of the um, story that your dad was about <laughs> to uh, reveal. But your story is quite amazing. In terms of your involvement with the hundred, give us a little bit of a, a little rundown. Um, so I started in the hundred actually when my dad brought me along to some events when I was little. Um, so there's a picture of me with Ken Barnes, the founder of the One Hundred Black Men of London, when I was about one years old at a Father's Day event. So that's kind of where I started with my, if you would say, involvement. I was brought along. I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> Um, but that's kind of where I started out and throughout the years my dad was taking pictures so I was brought along to lots of the 100 but men events and throughout my time I've kind of experienced what 100 was all about before I formally joined the program. Um, I properly joined the program when I was eight years old and I didn't, at the beginning I didn't go into the sessions to necessarily be a Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I didn't um, join the sessions to be a mentee. I um, was just sitting on the side coming along with my dad. And then there was a particular session, which was, gun, we call it guns, knives and violence. Um, I think that's interaction with the police now. That's what it's called now. And I just started to join in with the role plays that were, they were doing. I think I was eight years old at the time. And I just found it really engaging and really fun just to take part and listen to what everyone has to say. So I just really loved it. And since then, I've been attending the sessions fortnightly since I've been eight years old. I'm now 19, so yeah. Excellent, fantastic. So that's an, that's an absolutely uh, amazing wealth of experience working with the 100. And mm -hmm. um, to support um, some of the, the time that you spent with the 100, I compiled a little video um, <laughs> just to um, sort of take you through some of yours. This sounds like a bit like, um, Remember that? Oh, what was that program? This, what, is, this your is your life. life. This yeah, is your life. remember Chris? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm that guy who's like. Oh, I'm an Andrews or whoever, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, if you want to run the uh, the video, and Vanessa, while the video's running, 
if you want to just have a little, you know, tell us a little bit about some of the things that you can see and, you know. Okay. <laughs> that was when I was eight. <laughs> My first graduation, that's Ola Walake, the former president. That was 2012 graduation. That was one of the Black Heroes walk when I was Serena Williams. That was at Shandos. Um, that was in America when I went to the conference in Atlanta. This is some work we did with Niburu London. Um, I think that is at one of our quizzes. Um, that's when I met Tommy Smith at an event. Um, one of the graduations with the East group, <laughs> with Collar in the picture. That was at the last conference in 2019 at, in Las Vegas. It was similar in the conference as well. Um, that was at the conference in 2014 in Atlanta. This is one of the family fun days with Collectively Black. Um, that was at a luncheon that we went to that was run by Ken Barnes. That's with Kush Films at an event, doing fundraising. And that was at the Screen Nation Award that we got invited to. And this was also at Kush Films event where I had to read James Baldwin, um, graduation. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so for those who don't know, the last picture is actually um, lifted from the uh, website for the 100 Black Men of America. Um, they've used that lovely, powerful image of you from their conference in uh, 2019, I believe. Yes. Yeah, and it's been used uh, several times on their social media. Um, so, I mean, in terms of how has education, has your education been affected in terms of growing up through the 100? Mm. I think that in terms of growing my confidence, I think that's definitely what the 100 has helped me with, which in turn helped me in the classroom. So encouraging me to put my hand up, ask for help, ask for where um, where I need it. I think that's what the 100 really encouraged me to do because before, as I started, when I started, I was only eight years old, I was still in primary school and I didn't, I didn't quite have that confidence. And I think having that before I started secondary school was really helpful in my education because I came with a, with a different kind of confidence in comparison to my peers. So um, other people, like in my class, for example, in English, I'd, people would not pick on me, but they'd be like, oh, Vanessa always puts their hand up. But it's just because of that confidence that I had it, that was instilled by the 100. And I think I kind of maintained that throughout my whole secondary school education. And also in terms of um, self-identity, I think that was really important because you kind of get an understanding of who you are. And when you have that before you get put into secondary school, I think it really helps you go through the system. So you're not necessarily going to listen to a teacher's opinion of you. You're not going to listen to your peers' opinion of you, but you have a knowledge of self. And then yeah. in terms of not just navigating the classroom, but navigating the playground and navigating all of the different places that you are in during secondary school. So then you can focus on your education rather than maybe like behavioural issues and all other things like that. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. Um, you know, it's it's just an amazing testament to your father and the organisation that, uh, you know, you are the person who you are. And I've been privileged to listen to you speak um, publicly. You are an amazing public speaker. Um, <laughs> Ebony, Chris and Debbie, I mean, if you've got any questions for Vanessa, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. So, uh, Vanessa, what advice would you give to uh, someone from secondary school? You know, um, you know what, what, what one piece of advice would you give to someone going through secondary school? Now, to really help them succeed and get to where you've got to? Um, I think a piece of advice would be to kind of stick to your guts. I think in secondary school, not just education is there. It's kind of when you're like with your peers and things like that. And I feel like it's really important to stay true to yourself in that sense and not kind of be led through peer pressure and things like that. So as I said, you can focus on the education, even in the classroom, like you can really get pulled into messing about with your friends and things like that. But I think if you have knowledge yourself and have knowledge of why you're at school, because you're at school for such a long time. And I think if you go to 
to school with the idea that you just want to get the best out of it, I think that will really help you because it gives you the most. Great, thank you. That's great. Excellent. Thank you, Vines. What um, advice you would give to any of the young people who want to join the 100 but is in doubt, especially for the young girls? Um, for the young because girls, said, yeah. <laughs> because I said black, um, London black, you know, 100 black men, right? You know, because parents might have doubts, yeah. you know. So therefore, what would you actually say, say in terms of the parents to reassure them and also the young girl who would like to join but not to show? Um, for the young girls, I say don't be scared of the boys. For one, I feel like, um, especially going through like your teenage years when you're maybe 13, 14, 15, I think it can be quite daunting to be in a room full of guys and you know, like they play around and mess about, and there's like lots of masculinity and things like that. But I feel like you just, as I said, just stay true to yourself and then always be willing to put your hand up because I feel like it is slightly more difficult for girls because you feel kind of intimidated by the people in the room as well as um, thinking about what others think of you and all of that. But I think, yeah, just stick to who you are. And remember that to get the most out of the 100, you have to participate, you have to get involved and you have to do things that are not necessarily just in the sessions on the Saturday, but try and get involved with as much as you can because that's where you get the most opportunities. And I think that's how it will help you the most. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to the parents who were in doubt anyway? Um, for the parents, what can I say? I mean, especially the, especially the moms who thinking, oh, you know, one hundred black men, you know. I think having positive male role models in any child's life is a good thing. So, in terms of that, there's no worries. Hmm. But then there's lots of female volunteers there as well who can maybe relate to your child in a in a better way. But at hmm. the same time. Having those male re male role models around you really helps you. They're like lots of like big brothers and father figures, which I think it can only benefit you. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you very much. No problem. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? <laughs> yeah, fire away, Dunstan. Vanez, um, would you do you have um one or two memorable moments in the hundred or or moments that impacted you most in the hundred? That change uh, your trajectory in the hundred. Yeah, I think one of my most memorable moments was at the conference in 2014 and at in Atlanta. Um, we had to. Oh, sorry, 2016 in Atlanta. We had to make a speech in front of maybe about 15,000 people. Like there was quite a few people. And I think that experience for me going into it, I was really scared. I was like, oh my gosh, my belly. You know that feeling when you're about to talk in front of people. But I think me doing that and the reaction that I got out of, out of the crowd, it showed me that, oh wow, you actually can do this. Like obviously I'd made speeches before for the 100, but in terms of in front of that many people, I've never done something like that before. And then it makes it much easier to go into smaller events or to talk to literally anyone because you're like, oh, I did that. So when you're going anywhere else, you're like, oh, it's fine. I've done this before. And then you just don't feel it as much. So I think that was definitely definitely a memorable moment. But in terms of the session, I think one of my favourite moments was when I was quite young, maybe I was eight or nine. And I think we were at West Green Learning Centre. And there was lots of older diamonds there. So I was about nine, maybe they were about 13, 14. And I think just being in a classroom with them and listening to them talk, I think that was really inspirational because as a young person, I was looking up to them as, oh, wow, they're so amazing. Like, that's what that's what I saw in my eyes. And seeing them now, um, for example, um, Lauren Nicole, she's like an influencer, body, body, um, body positive um, kind of campaigner. And just seeing her work and seeing everything that she's done. And I used to be in the same classroom as her. So that kind of um, inspiration that I found in The 100, I think that's really lovely as well. And one other question, Vanessa, you've been to two conferences, um, Atlanta and Las mm -hmm. Vegas. What, what impact you go to the conferences? You see all those other people from other chapters of The 100. What kind of impact does it have on you? I think seeing all of the other chapters it makes you see how big the 100 is. Um, and of course, like we see it here, there's loads of people in 100 Black Men of London, but seeing it on an international level, it makes you feel a part of something much bigger and much greater.
and I, and seeing all of the affiliates with the 100 as well so lots of the um for example Tommy Smith who helps out who's an amazing inspiration um if you don't know who Tommy Smith is he was at the what's the what Olympics was it the 1968 yeah 1968 Olympics 68 Mexico Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, he did the um, Black Power salute. So seeing all of the amazing people who are part of the 100 Black Men and who want to make it grow and the founders of the 100 Black Men as well, I think that makes you feel like you're a part of history. And in that sense, having that and having that big organisation behind you to kind of aid you on and to kind of rally behind you with whatever you want to do, I think it's a really powerful thing to be a part of. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vanessa. No problem. Ebony, did you have any question you want to ask? I guess my question, you kind of touched on it before, but I guess for some of the diamonds that are in the 100 now and are in part of the kind of mentoring program, what would you say to them like as a tip to kind of get the most out of their experience? Because you said you've, you've had so much experiences going abroad and at all these different events. How can um, diamonds now kind of capitalize on what the 100 can offer? Um, I think as a new diamond coming in, one of the main things I can say is to just try and participate. I know it's quite difficult as a young person to put your hand up in a room full of strangers, especially if it's your first couple of times. But if you kind of interact with everyone, it makes you feel a lot more comfortable. And if you um, talk to your mentors and things like that and try and open up to them, they can relate to you in a much easier way. So then when you are in the sessions and you do feel a bit nervous, they can help you and rally you on and be like, oh, it's all right, just put your hand up, it's fine. And I think like the applause that you get after speaking in the sessions as well, all of that that the 100 brings and kind of the idea that you have to stand up to speak. I think all of that just builds on your character and builds on what you have. And then it just makes you a much better person. So I think, yeah, definitely just talk to the people that are in the room, talk to your mentors because they're there to help you and they just want the best for you. And then just try your hardest and just try and participate as much as you can, even if you feel scared. Fantastic. <laughs> Great stuff, Finesse. Thank you again so much. Um, no Dunstan, I hope we've sorted our, uh, our technical issues out now. Um, so welcome back yes, again. So. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, if you'd like to just tell us a bit about, you know, we did start off um, telling us about meeting Ken Barnes. If you can continue a little bit about that with a, a brief introduction. Yeah, um, initially in the hundreds, what I was doing mainly was taking the photographs. So for the first four, five, six years, I was taking photographs. So by doing that, I was at all the events. I went to the galas, I was at all the graduations. The very first graduation in May 2002, I was there, took the very first picture of the first graduates, and that was kind of like a very iconic moment. So I've been at every stage of major events within the organisation, and it's quite interesting. That one day I was a photographer, next day in 2009 I started mentoring, and then eventually I got on the board um, of the 100 in 2015 when I was the VP of programmes, and then eventually I was the president in 2017, so I've, I've had a journey and a half. But um, I think for me, that initial start where I was at all the events, watching everyone else doing their things, capturing the history of the 100, for me, that was a very important thing to do. And I'm glad that I did that and got a grounding of who everyone was in that context, got known by everyone, and then graduated myself. And then it's funny enough, having Vanessa and um, when she got older, old enough to actually come to the sessions, um, that was the key for me to start actually doing mentoring in 2009. So yeah, it's been a great journey actually. And then also I think what I've seen as well is that the way the organization has um, risen, uh, we started off in North, in North London, then we had a South London chapter, which myself and Vanessa went along to. Um, and then after that, there was an op opportunity for an East London program. And funny enough, um, I'm from the borough of Newham and that's where um, we wanted to, to have the programme in East London, so we, we actually sourced the sites at Stratford, um, Stratford College, which is incidentally now knocked down, and um, we started the East London Community Mentoring Programme there. But then following on from that, we had North, South, East and West London, so we had four um, community mentoring programmes running concurrently each, um, each fortnight with the 100. So yeah, it's been a nice this um, journey definitely fantastic so Dunstan I, I gotta say um, for people who don't know Dunstan I, 
as I said to Vanessa earlier, I don't think you've ever worn the same garment of clothes twice ever. Am I right about that, Dunstan? Because you've you like I'm not sure like about a, that. Like a, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you just transform. What's the what's the word I'm looking for? The animal that changes its its color. Oh, chameleon. Chameleon. <laughs> that's what you are. <laughs> Dunstan is a chameleon, and and in order to uh to show that, um, Mike's gonna run a video, and uh, Dunstan, it's like you to um sort of. Uh, narrate if you can some of the things okay. that you see um talk about what you've been doing um but mm -hmm. guys watching you'll notice you will never see Dunstan in the same outfit twice i know that i created this video anyway <laughs> run that video mike so here we are Na 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 naburu um it's an organization we um, went along to they did some training with us and then they invited us to deliver an actual session to the elders in the community. So it was an intergenerational session, and it really was a, a great thing to deliver. And we had the spectrum of of the community there. Basically, we had young young children, and they were delivering sort of to, to the elder generation. Um, that's Diaro there. Um, that's a one of the elders that came along, and they were really really impressed with the attitude and the abilities of the young people and the way they connected to them oh that looks like me <laughs> so yeah they had the opportunity to um to learn podcasting to actually create an actual session for the elders so we went one week for the training and two weeks later we actually went along to deliver the session and this is all in top them this was at harringay men cap center this was and um yeah now that is um an organization called collectively black they actually I've been going since 1991 before i was at the 100 i do annual quizzes with them um, i used to take the nez along to these quizzes and uh, we did a collaboration with them in 2013 so we had a, a, a black history month quiz back at uh, shandos east where the which was the headquarters of the east london um, community mentoring program we had about 10 teams that day and it really was a fun family event you can see from the pictures the whole spectrum of the family was was there and it really was a fun and educational event. You know, everyone took part and had fun. That was the main thing. But at the same time, there's lots of knowledge being being learnt. Um, this is our famous Black Heroes Walk. The object behind that is to go along as your famous as a famous person in history. And everyone really put the efforts in. You can see there different characters like Marcus Garvey. I think Vanessa was Venus Williams there. I think she was one year. I'm not sure who they were, but you can see there's Bevis Gooden, he's uh, Marcus Carvey there, and uh, Herbie, former VP of admin. Marvis. Oh, look, there's Tommy Smith himself. <laughs> Goodness. But yeah, this was a really, really good event. It took place in um, Brockwell Park. Fortunately, we had a nice, oops, we've switched now to a very recent event where they went around London to look at the, the black history in London. So it was uh, one of the CMP sessions, and they went around all the. Oops, let's skip now to our 2012 um, quality time. This was an event we created, and it was um, a mini sports day in the park for men and children. And we ended up in Rhythm Kitchen in Stratford for a big buffet meal of everyone. So we all did the sports during the day. Then afterwards we went and we had a really nice buffet meal and it really was a, a great event to see the men and the children of the community um, out there. Um, they did the sport and everyone was participating. There was tennis, football, basketball, you name it, we were doing it. And um, it really was a funny event. This is one of our health, one of our helps. Another fun day we had with Let's Keep Black. This is the Color Run that we did, which was, again, was a very great event. We raised a lot of money and everyone got involved. And as you can see, I'm the only one who doesn't get any paint on myself. See, paint doesn't stick on me. <laughs> there's um, Alistair and, oh yeah, Kush Films. I must say, Kush Films have been a magnificent supporter of the 100 Black Men of London. They um, displayed our logo on their screen. They supported our events, so they let, let us come along and raise buckets, raise buckets, with buckets to raise money. And um, they've always been a very good supporter of us. These are some of the um, education through film events we've had over the years, which there have been many. This is Tommy Smith when he came along to the launch of our 100 book club. There's myself and Tommy Smith at a recent event to celebrate 50 years of that salute. 
And every time he goes to the conference in America, Tommy Smith is there. He runs the um, morning exercise class. And you go along there, you get that opportunity to, to meet him, to do a session with him and to, to, to get a photo opportunity. So that's one thing to strive towards. I don't know if you guys know this guy. This is um, Dr. Umar. He, oh, and here's one of our most famous members. He's an on, he's an honorary member, Lennox Lewis. He became our honorary member in 2003. And this is very recent. This is um, looks like 2019 graduation. It's Kwame Kwame He's a playwright. He's a uh, he's involved in uh, the Young Vic, and he's one of our one of our um, honorary members. I don't know if you know this. So solid. And uh, Peter Herbert, back in the days, they'd come along to our graduation as near as Akala. We had him yeah, at fantastic. our East London Mentoring Programme. Yeah, as well, you can see, there's quite a few. You, you, um... <laughs> you did well. I like the speed a bit. I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I had to squeeze it in, so it Gosh. ended up being a little bit faster than I originally planned. But yeah, I'm no problem. Tell us more about some of the wonderful things that, you know, um, you could see on the film and, and you know, other things that you've, you've, you've experienced with The 100. Well, I think that with The 100, one of the most uh, exciting events is always the graduation every year. You see that progress of the diamonds from when they come in with very little confidence and their confidence grows. And by the time they get on there and they're on that stage of graduation and the pride in their face and the confidence they have is, is so amazing. And I think also you see the growth of mentors as well, actually. They come along a little bit nervous as well. But by the time they're gelled with the rest of the experienced mentors, you, you, they develop quite a lot. And we've seen a lot of people who have stepped up within the organisation. And in fact, we've got a young man who was actually a, ment a mentee. His name's Solomon. And he's now an actual mentor. So he's been through the entire programme as a mentee. You know, he's come back and he's an actual He's an actual mentor. And that's the sort of thing we want to encourage in the 100. We have peer mentors like Benez, who's been on the programme. We want people to actually experience the programme and actually come back and give back to their community. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just think there's so many opportunities for development for people, men and women. And then there's that opportunity to, to grow as a family and work together in a collaborative way, definitely. So once again, guys, if you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question or questions to Dunstan. Dunstan, I've got a question. Hi, Chris. Wait, what it is, I just, want to, uh, hi, I just want to know, what was the real motivation for you joining the hunting? <laughs> and, and the reason I asked that, I know yeah. you said that I was the photographer mm -hmm. and et cetera, but what was it that really drew you towards joining the hundred? Okay, I mean, at that time, like, at that time in the early 2000s, there was lots of lots of things happening in that community, lots of networking events. And in fact, I was a member of a of a networking um, um, organization called the Executive and Professional Networks. But they tended to be more more socially led, and they weren't really impacting the community. Although they were nice to go to. Um, you could network for a business on a business basis and um, on a social basis as well. When you heard about the hundred and the fact that they were impacting children, you knew that they were impacting our future, our fu people in our yeah. in our community and the future of our community. And so that was a real pull, knowing that you can impact change for the community, for the future, and for the better. So it was that action point, basically. Great, and obviously you, I can see you've been manifested with Vanessa on the screen as well. So uh, you've been true to your work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Dunstan, you've had a lot of um, fa fantastic time in the 100. Which one of those would you, can you actually identify which one of those is the most memorable and why? I think um, the most memorable or the most magical was when we went Magic. to the conference in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, what happened was, um, through former president Olu, Olu Alake, um, he had a contact in Atlanta and um, I got in touch with her and she said she'd come and she'd take us out for the day. And um, not only did she come and take us out, she had a limousine waiting outside. And if you saw the look on the three diamonds on their faces when they saw that limousine, they thought it was a wind up. They really thought they were on some sort of <laughs> TV show, but they had a full limousine 
and um, they took us around Atlanta. We went to the Martin Luther King's house. We went to Spelman. We went to Morehouse, Clark's College. Um, it was such an, an experience. And also, the person that that, that um, owns the fleet of limousines, he's a a, um, a funeral director. His name's Willie Watkins. And um, we went along to hit to his um, parlor, as it were. We actually <laughs> saw the the coffins. And he he gave us a talk. He told us about real estate and um, the value of um, grave, grave, graveyards, as it were, because that's prime real estate is, you know. And I think that day, not only did myself and Herbie, who was there, but the Three Diamonds, I think the experience they got was so, that was such a valuable and priceless experience. And I don't think that many people to have an actual experience like that, to be treated like that, to be chauffeured around quite literally in a, in a limousine. It was just such an impact and something for them, those guys to actually aim for in, in the future to have that sort of lifestyle. So yeah, I think that really, really stands out. Thank you. And Ebony, do you have a question? Yeah, um, kind of springboarding from what Chris was asking before. Um, I guess my question is kind of what keeps you coming back? Um, like you've you kind of served your time as a, a um, as a member of the 100, but you're still coming back and talking to people and getting involved with events. What keeps you kind of here, essentially? Well, actually, I'm not going to be here for much longer. Actually, this will be my last month. Actually, I feel that um, I've done quite a bit, and in Vanessa, I've got a legacy at the 100. So I feel now I can step aside and um, let others do their bit. And I think as long as Vanessa is around the 100, I've got a, a stakehold in the 100. So yeah, I've had a great journey, and it's quite fitting actually to be alongside Vanessa in this um, this um, this broadcast and to um, to be bound out in this way. I think is a, it's perfect. Um, it's been a really really great experience, and, and um, I've seen so many people come and go, but you still keep in touch with them. The 100 is a continuous family, you know. You'll find, you know, even though people have left, you're still in, in, in touch with them. You still network with them and do things with them, and we all get together and share great memories. So yeah, it's been a, a wonderful journey. Thank you. Thank you all. So thank you very much for joining us, Vanessa and Dunstan. Um, thank you, guys. I, I, I know Andy Roach is in the chat. He's been saying that the greatest moment of your time at the 100 was meeting him. <laughs> Andy is our... our, our, uh, our, our, our in-house joker. <laughs> but, um, no, yeah, he definitely made me laugh. Good to have you on board. Always, always with a smile uh, and with love. Uh, we love that you know you're always <laughs> here with us, Andy. Um, and maybe one day we 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 should get you up on uh, on one of our platforms. Um, definitely. So yeah, I'm 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 happy with that. Um, I'm going to move on now to talking about some of the work that the education pillar has done um, with the 100, obviously. Um, you know, the 100 um, has a number of pillars, four pillars. Uh, one is education, one is mentoring, uh, one is health and well-being, and the other one is economic empowerment. And I myself have been involved in pretty much all four pillars <laughs> at some point in time. Um, Dunstan, just out, just, out, just out of interest, um, you know, you've also been involved, and I know I've worked with you, um, in, in years gone by in various elements of the four pillars. Is there one pillar that stands out for you um, or have you favoured more than another? I think because um, of the young people, mentoring um, stands out, always will stand out in that context. But um, I think we need to, to recognise that education, that pillar is involved with almost everything that we do. Um, it might not sound like it is, but to have mentoring you've got to train mentors you've got to write your session plans and things like that and whatever you do within the 100 you need a plan around it you need to educate the people who are doing it so that that education pillar although it's not got bells and whistles on it it, it really underpins everything that we actually do without that sort of knowledge sharing and sharing with knowledge within those pillars um we won't get an awful long way yeah but fantastic. um and that i think you know the 100 is known for their mentoring um, but all the other pillars are equally as important in that context. Yeah, and and quite frankly, you know, even in you know health and well-being and, and economic empowering, there's an element of knowledge sharing, which is educational. Mm -hmm. You know, we 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 continue to strive 
to educate the public. And it's, it's important that people who are watching up will understand that we don't only work with children. You know, the economic empowerment um, um, does seminars, does workshops with adults, um, even the mentoring, as well as mentoring the children, we mentor the, the parents of the children as well. So when the children come to the sessions with their parents, the, break, the, the children and the parents break out into separate rooms and each is given a learning session. Um, which they can go back home after and talk about what they learn in their session. So, you know, if you're talking about crime with the children, we might talk about crime with the parents. And that is an opportunity afterwards for parent and child to have a discussion and make it even more personal. Um, yeah, so... Just to add to that, um, Tony, um, that, um, that, that thing what we call the Parents and Partnership Programme, that was um, created by a, a young lady called um, Jennifer Lewis back in 2009. And um, it really did result in the fact that parents were dropping their children off and not doing anything. They'd go and have a coffee and they thought it, was a bit, it would be a good idea to actually, for the parents to remain and actually get involved. And that's how the Parents and, par parents and Partnership Programme started off. Yeah, and um, just also to mention, um, one of our biggest draws over the years um, especially in the early years, was education through film. And a gentleman by the name of Tony Warner championed this. And um, we'd have venues, cinemas, places like the Rio, Museum of London, lots of other venues where we invite the public to come along to see educational films on um, the black, on black culture, basically, a range of films. Um, which, and that, that really drew in a lot of people to the 100 and got a lot of support from that's how a lot of people actually got their children on the programs because they came to see the films and found out more about the program and um got involved that way so that really was a draw and it's something we still do today and in fact um quite recently um 2016 i think we went to clapham picture house i arranged a trip to clapham picture house we saw queen of catway then we saw hidden figures and then we had a private screening from disney of um black panther Thanks to one of our members, Vicky, who um, worked there. So they had a private screening for us. So little things like that have really been outstanding things to think about and to, to, to be involved in and really help to bring the community together when you have those sort of events and exclusive, it's exclusive for yourself. So um, that really, those, those are all, all also like ma magical memories that I can remember. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dunstan. So I'm going to move on now. Um, we're out of time. Um, my next um, question is going to be to Ebony. Ebony, un unmute yourself. So, Hi. Ebony, um, I'd like you to sort of reintroduce yourself, in, like um, Jay Z. Allow me to introduce myself. Um, just tell us about your time with the hundred, and also what you're doing in terms um, of current work with the education pillar, if you may. Yeah, so I joined the 100 last July. Um, I kind of saw the kind of pandemic and COVID-19 situation as an opportunity to kind of use this excess of time that I had um, wisely and kind of give back as well. Um, so I joined the education team. Um, we've done quite a lot in the past year, considering that everything has uh, moved online. Um, but prior to kind of lockdown in February, we did the um, careers fair. So we had talks from different employers, uh, JP Morgan, the military, London Underground. Um, so it's kind of give the diamonds an understanding of kind of what careers are out there and what you could potentially strive towards. Um, but then the situation changed in March. Um, we went online and we kind of had the um, daily brain teasers um, which was like a quiz for people to get involved with um, each day. Um, in spring, there was even a financial trading course. So like you said as well, education kind of underpins a lot of the other pillars. So this was also about economic empowerment and educating kind of people in our community about being smart with money and how you can make your money work for you. Um, in the summer, again, we had a, a four week program um, for the diamonds and kind of two highlights where we had uh, Chris himself gave a presentation and a talk called Power Presenter, getting the diamonds to kind of stand up and gain some more confidence in public speaking and using um, kind of specific acronyms and to kind of get them comfortable with doing it and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, and 
another highlight for me was getting involved with a, a baking event that we had virtually on Zoom, which was quite fun. Um, we had um, a pastry chef, a professional pastry chef came in um, to kind of teach us how to create brownies. And it was really nice to see like some of the diamonds were there with their parents and they were all baking together. And it was just a nice afternoon where we all got to do something fun together. Um, so it's not all just it's that's one thing that I think pu pulled me towards the education team. It's not just about like how can we capitalize on like learning at school and learning outside of school. It's about how we can build skills that kind of support us in any journey that we're on. So whether that be an academic journey going on towards university and careers planning or whether that be how can I kind of use my hobbies and skills and develop these so that I'm a well-rounded individual essentially. Fantastic. Sounds like you've been doing quite a bit of work since you came, Ebony. Um, yeah. <laughs> Chris, uh, I'm going to go to you. Is there, uh, if you can give us a little rundown of your time joining, what have been your highlights? And also, I believe you're going to tell us about some of the work that the 100 are going to be doing going forward, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting because I joined again during the pandemic time. I've not met anybody. <laughs> It's all been it's all been online on Zoom and no no uh, apart from Jeff who came to my house the other day to drop a certificate off I've not met anybody so uh, it's amazing and but but what, what what is amazing about it even though we've not met anyone I still feel like I'm part of something massive and great because all the interactions we've had not just as an educational team but just as a general team have been really positive have been fun. And uh, makes you want to come back more, you know. So I guess that's been my experience, but I still want to meet everyone at some point, you know, face to face, you know. So, uh, but it's been great fun. And um, for me, you know, the education pillar is great. Again, very flexible. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what, loads of ideas. And for me, education isn't about stuffing information in people, it's about bringing the best out of people. And I think that's what I see, hear, and feel all the time uh, when I'm working with, with the team. And it's just great. And it's lovely to see the diamonds really lapping up all the stuff that we're doing, you know. And so so for the future, you know, there's loads of things. We're still going to continue the things such as the careers fair, you know, that transition into secondary school and how to succeed in school. So, you know, that's important. But we're planning to, to support and run sessions you know, with the older diamonds as well, you know, entry requirements into university, that kind of thing, making sure that they can write really good personal statements, drop in uh, clinics with, you know, a pupil referral uh, unit teacher as well to really help people from that side of things. Even stronger collaboration with organisations like the Met Police, commercial banks, and of course, schools, you know. And, you know, it's great to have Vanessa on the on the screen as well, because one of the things is continuing to build confidence for the young people so that they can apply to some of these universities. Why not? You know, the, the sky's the limit, you know, and the evidence is there. So, you know, more stuff with uh, Oxbridge visits and things like that. And then, and then finally, you know, build your educational talks, you know. The plan is to continue this format and kind of run more and more sessions like that for the diamonds, by the diamonds. You know, so we're really continuing to build this peer mentoring the whole way through via the education team. So that's kind of what the future looks like and much, much more. I'm guessing we're always taking uh, ideas from everybody and continuing to build that, you know. So hopefully that, that gives you an insight, Tony. Thank you very much, Chris. Yes, very much so. And, uh, you know, all I can say is I wish you continued success. You know, we've been doing this eight, uh, 20 years now, and uh, it's great to see that people like yourself and Ebony uh, are stepping up into the, the hot seat and, and, and continuing the fantastic work that this organisation has done for the 20 years. Um, at this point, I'm just going to throw the, the whole room open. If anyone wants to ask anybody any questions, you know, if you want to ask me any questions, feel free. Um, Michael is in the background. I'm even going to call him out and say, you know, Mike, if you've got anything to say, Now's your time, buddy. Come on. Let's see what you got to say. <laughs> I'd just like to add on to what Chris was saying about um, the way 
the sessions happen. Um, people don't stand in front of a class of children and lecture them in any way. We more st would stand beside them and try to get information out of them. We'll have an objective around the session, but then it's for the for the diamonds to to feed into that. You know, we just try to get the information from the diamonds, and that's very very important. We, we're not trying to replicate what school are doing. We're doing something completely different. We're giving the young people confidence to to think for themselves and to to, sh to show what they think and, and value their opinions and their views and i think that's a very very important thing we're not trying to replace school in any way we're trying to enhance the learning processes of the young people and getting them to think for themselves and getting them to value that thing what Vinay's mentioned about we clap after they're given an answer and we get people to stand up to express themselves you know what a long while that we used to tell people when they did stand up if they weren't speaking loud enough if someone was standing in the corner of the room and they said, if you can't hear you in the corner of the room, then you have to say it again. So I really encourage them to speak to everyone in the room. And things like when we have those sessions around and effective communication and encouraging eye contact and things like that, those skills that we put upon the young people, they, they take them into schools and wherever they go and, and they, their confidence just, just skyrockets, absolutely. Thank you. So Michael, you've joined us, great to see you. Um, I'm going to give a big shout out to uh, a couple of people. Uh, Michael Shodey, uh, who you, you can see is our Vice Pre President of Operations uh, and has been working in the background doing all the technical stuff. So, uh, Michael, please come and introduce yourself. Say hello. Hello, hello, hello. Um, I didn't know this was going to happen. So, uh, <laughs> lucky, lucky I wasn't doing anything too crazy in the background. Um, but yeah. Um, my name is Michael. I'm the current Vice President of Oper Operations. Um, I've been on the board now. I think this will be my third year. So previously, I was Vice President of Finance. Um, this year, we moved on to Vice President of Operations. Um, question, question, question. Okay. I've got, I've got a few questions. This is for everyone, actually. Um, so anyone can answer this. So obviously, the 100 has been running for 20 years. Um, I think I've been part of the 100 now. This might be my fifth year. Um, and I think we're moving in the right direction. There's quite a lot of obviously organizations out there that are doing a lot of great stuff as well. Not as great as the 100, but I am biased. Um, but <laughs> there, is a, there is a lot of great organizations. So I just want to ask you guys, do you believe that, it's a two part question. Do you believe that the 100 International um, and the 100 Black Men of London are still fit for purpose? One, and two, are the 100 moving in the right direction um, to progress in the future and go for another 20, 100 years? What do you guys think? Right, I'll answer the second part. The fact that progress for the future, yes, we are online. So therefore it means that we are actually connecting with the technology and how life is going to be. So whether or not it is COVID have actually forced us into that, um, that situation, we are actually making the most of it. And we are actually taking our young people with us. So which means that they're actually leading because we know the, the future, we are actually giving them the opportunity to, to navigate the whole situation. And we're also giving them the opportunity to gain experience in public speaking and organizing situations like that. Especially the 28 years, a lot of the young people have actually been leading the sessions. So which is brilliant because the future are the young people. So obviously, yes, the 100 is actually taking them along. Uh, so I'm going to um, I think as long uh, as the two pence um, in terms of, you know, are we, uh, is, the, is the 100 fit for purpose? Um, the job that the 100 does, as far as I'm concerned, is fantastic. Um, all of the things that we've mentioned so far, you know, from the education, the uh, mentoring, the, the economic empowerment, the health and well-being, you know, these are very, very important elements to the community. And the fact that the people who are part of the organization have taken their time all volunteers to step up and join to help the community, I believe is a fantastic thing that needs to be heralded. Um, we really should be heralded a lot more. In fact, I, you know, I've made it clear, I think, bearing in mind this is our 20th anniversary, I think we should be getting a letter from the Queen because that's 20 long years of hard work, free of charge to help improve society and, and affect those kids that have come through our, our, our doors. Um, 
it's it's just an amazing uh, organization. And yes, you're right. There are many other organizations doing similar things. Um, but, you know, we have to continue to um, progress and we have to continue to grow. We have to look at ourselves as an organization and bear in mind the changes to society. You know, 20 years ago, the struggles for children are completely different to the struggles children face today. You know, the difficulties for parents are way different to what they faced 20 years ago. You know, so, so, so much has happened in relation to society. And therefore, it's very important that an organization as deep as, as the 100 is, is able to address and understand those changes. You know, look, we, we didn't have computers 20 years ago when we were in 100. You know, we're now doing everything almost exclusively by computer, you know, and being able to embrace, you know, the technology and the social media, so on and so forth, I believe is, is part of uh, what is very important in terms of taking this organization going forward. I'll just add to that with, um, I think also, um, well, it's, it's important to, to remain adaptable. I think we should also value the, the role of parents because we, we send the children there to the hundred. Um, they go for a three hour session every fortnight, but unless the parents are, are, are playing their part and um, supplementing what the hundred is teaching them and, and providing that environment for the child at home, then that's not really gonna work. So it really will only work as long as the parents, the diamonds and the mentors are connecting with each other and are all on that same journey to get excellence from, excellence from the children. I think the 100 just needs to keep on adapting to the changes in society. I think the 100 Black Men of America, they've been around for a long while and I think they always will. And I think they've always adapted, they've changed, they've responded to the pandemic in a similar way that the 100 has. And I think an organization is only as good as the people in it. And I think as long as people are in there, create ideas and innovation, I think we'll, we'll be okay. And I think one of the things we should do is um, do more collaborations with other organizations because we're not perfect in that context. And there's so much we could do in the community with other organizations. The things we did in Nibura, that was really great. We, we went out there in the community and, and had a different audience. And I think more things like that with 100 are collaborating with other organizations would be really, really good to give us a wider berth in the community. And just one other thing, I think that um, the, we need to use the internet, the, the, the HQ and the, the, the international aspects of the organization and trying to get more people, more youngsters to um, get involved when we have conferences. I mean, the conferences are available for not just the young people, um, men, men, women, volunteers, members can go along. And I think that's one of the things we should really encourage because once people go to those conferences, they get a sense of how big the organization is and the possibilities that are there. That's another thing I think we should encourage that sort of connection with the um, whole international organization. Go ahead, Chris. I can see you're you're ready to answer, are you, Chris? Yeah, all, all I was gonna say was, you know, you asked the question about it being fit for purpose, the organization being fit for purpose. And I, I've attended a lot of meetings, and what I can see, like you said, Dunstan, it's all about the people, isn't it? And the intention from all the people. Uh, from everybody that's collectively and they're, they're almost like one big brain is focused so much on really pulling people up in the community that it, for me it is fit for purpose so you know that's just my observation and Ebony have you any ideas um I guess kind of going off what Chris said um there are many opportunities within the organization that we get to kind of share our, our views and opinions on what's happening and the direction we are going in. I think it's important that we, we have these opportunities to kind of get together as an organization, as the 100 Black Men of London, and discuss like what's going well, what, we're, what we want to achieve and how we can get there. Um, so we do have our monthly like management meetings and our um, discussions with the board and things like that so I think having that continue and just having an open forum for discussion and being willing to change and kind of go with the flow of the way things are changing um I, th I can't see how we won't um be successful can I ask um Vanessa the youngest person 
in the room, let's say. say. <laughs> What's your view, having experienced the programme, being a young person, how would you like to see the, the 100 go forward? Um, I think that the 100 right now is doing great, but I just feel like they need to utilise young people a bit more to kind of push the programme a bit more because it is 2021 and in terms of going online, um, using social media, using YouTube and things like that on all of those other platforms, I think in today's society to get that reach is really, really important. For example, on YouTube, you can reach 100,000 people if you get a good enough video, do you know what I mean? So I think in terms of that, it's important and having um, using the younger diamonds, the peer mentors and in terms of having like a slightly younger board as well, I think that's really important to kind of push it forward into the 21st century and in that sense I think that's what, what we can do better but in terms of it being fit for purpose and what I've experienced I feel like it's a really amazing experience and seeing not just me but also lots of my peers go, go through the organization and seeing the amazing things that they've done in the community for example Jonas who's got his own business and things like that Adam who's an amazing speaker and you know, um, I think seeing my peers as well and what they've done it, it's, an, it's a testament to the 100 that we're doing something right and I think once you get to 1920 and you've seen the people who are in the 100 and seeing everything that they're doing, it's like, OK, then I didn't just waste the last 10 years of my life. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm a part of something much bigger and I'm a part of something great. So, of course, I think the 100 black men is fit for purpose and they're doing an amazing job. Happy Mike. <laughs> yeah, wicked, wicked, wicked. And it, it, it ended the way I wanted it to end because, um, yeah, me, me, Vanessa, Adam, Jonas, Amunet, all the guys in peer mentoring. What, what Vanessa just said is exactly what, what I've been saying for a long time, um, and I think that's just for it's, it's for everyone. Um, I think the way the way we should be kind of being now is the young people, not just in the one hundred, but in the world. Um, the one, the the young people should be at the forefront, and the older generation are behind to support them. So the older generation are the the foundations which they which they build upon. Uh, the young people are going to come with the new ideas and a new way to take things forward. Like, it, it always surprises me, and not to go into politics, but it always surprises me when you see the new prime minister or the new president in America or whatever, and they're like 70 years old. And I'm like, what, what are you going to do now? You haven't, you haven't got the energy. Um, you should be in the background supporting rather, rather than being at the forefront. So, yeah, I'm glad that like, Vanessa um, answered in that way. And I think the 100 is transitioning into that, um, which is gonna, which is a change that some people are welcoming and some people are not welcoming. But it is the change that needs to come, um, and that's okay. yeah, that's it for me. I'm gonna jump off, but I wasn't meant to be on this anyway. But, um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Thank you all. So we have come to the end of the first hour of the show. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Dunstan. Uh, Thank Ebony you. Ebony and Chris, we're now going to bring in um, a bunch of uh, educators from around the world who have been invited to talk with us about education. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to also, while I've got the opportunity, um, say a big thank you to another person in the background, <laughs> president of education, that's Yinka Kuye, um, who has been doing lots of work behind the scenes for months and months and months on end and i know she works really hard and you know sometimes we're up at silly o'clock in the morning um doing stuff to to put all of this together so thank you very much yinka for your your your, your diligence and hard work and um yeah so mike if you can start introducing um the panelists into the room and uh debbie the show is yours <laughs> Okay. Right. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I was just looking at it because I thought there was there was more than that. There should have been a few more people. Okay. Hi, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you guys for actually taking the opportunity and giving up your time to come onto the show. I really, we really do appreciate that. And um, can you just introduce yourselves, please? You want to start with me? Yes, please. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm Amanda Edwin. I actually live in Canada. Um, so I'm in North America. I am originally from the Caribbean, the island of Trinidad and Tobago. And I've been an educator now for over 30 years. Right now, I do teach adults. I'm into adult education over the last few years. Um, 
And as Debbie knows, and because we've chatted before, education is my passion. So being here and being able to discuss um, education is nothing I would have said no to. I always say yes when it comes to talking about education. So thank you, Debbie, for having me. And I'm interested to hear what we're going to be talking about, you know, what we're talking about, what's going to come out of the discussion. Um, the first half of the show was very enlightening for me, learning more about the 100, um, the 100s. So that has given me quite a few ideas that I think I want to take back, you know, into what I do every day. So thank you. And I look forward to, you know, chatting with the rest of you throughout the next hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can you guys introduce yourself next? Um, I'm Carlisha. I've worked in education for about 10 years. I know I don't look like I have enough years for that, but for about 10 years, I've worked with a broad spectrum from special needs all the way up to sixth form. Um, my speciality is dealing with um, students that we have classes, students with challenging behaviour. Um, as Amanda said, education and, and young people are uh, definitely a passion of mine, especially in melanated young people, because I feel like education is sort of swept, and swept aside in our community. So I think pushing that so that they see how important it is is really, really, really one of my passions. So yeah, I was really um, touched by some of how passionate they were with working with young people, making sure that they're on, on a track to education. Because as I, I always say to my young people, yes, you can get to where you want, but you want to work harder. You want to work smarter, not harder. So yeah. it's smarter to go and try and get that degree. And so you've got got that that behind you. So it was, yeah, it was a lovely chat. OK, thank you. Hey, everybody. Oh. Come on to see you, you frozen. Just more information about it. I was excited about Vanessa's story when she, she shared with us that she joined when she was actually eight years and now she's She's still part of this amazing organization. Wow. Well, wow. Uh, okay, let me go back and introduce myself. It's it's amazing. It's amazing what, what the organization is doing, like, like confidence and all that, that, everything that they're doing. It's amazing. Okay, introducing myself, guys. I am Homoto Libakim, and um, I'm from South Africa. Um, by the moment, I'm living and working in Ghana. Um, um, I'm also a teacher, and I've been teaching now for, for 10 years. And in these 10 years, I've, I've been complaining, like really complaining, like complaining for 10 years. Guys, that's the longest time of complaining, that, you know, our teachers are not treated well, teachers are not celebrated, teachers are not acknowledged for what they do. 10 years of complaining. So um, last year, I decided to, you know, to do something about it and stop complaining. I decided to to start an organization where I celebrate teachers. And we started last year in September and it's going um, very well. We celebrate teachers for um, entire month. And, and it's good to see um, bringing smiles into teachers' faces and celebrate their work that they're doing. Because teachers are most important people in our communities, in our societies, and they continue building. So it's, it's what, what I do, what I'm passionate about, celebrating other people's work, which are teachers. Thank you, guys. Okay. Right. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's interesting because one of the common thread we all seem to share is the passion we have for education and for young people. And in order for us to get the most and the best out of young people, we need to be passionate because they need to see that passion from us. So it it's really is interesting. Right, um, as educators, I do feel that there's sometimes we need to challenge tradition because we also need to realize that education is not only in the classroom, education is constantly. So mm -hmm. don't, 
what's going on there? So those are the things we really need to start looking at, that we need to remind the young people that because they haven't made it in terms of academically go through the traditional route, that doesn't mean that there are no hope, nor does it mean that they cannot excel or be the best they can be. So that's some of the things we're going to be talking about, um, challenging the status quo and challenging, you know, the traditional education. The first question is in terms of how do we see education? Just as, oh, where's my technical guy? Hold on, Mike. <laughs> right, <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> well, to what extent I, is, is right, to what, can you guys see the question? Or it's just me seeing it? No, we can see the question. We can see okay, the question. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, it is your bad. <laughs> to what extent are you a help or hindrance to your child career aspiration? So when we're talking about parents and when we're talking to parents, how do you think that parents can be a help or hindrance to their children? And I'm taking that even further into the education sector. How do you think educators could also be a hindrance or an aspiration for children? We know as being in the education sector. Um, I find that unfortunately, this is from pastoral, so I'm sorry teachers, but as a pastoral lead, I find that there's a lot of unconscious bias when it comes to some of our children and they get stigmatised as soon as they walk into a classroom. So you'll get your rowdy boys, they'll walk in and automatically they're pushed towards sports because that seemed to let out all that energy and that's where they're pushed towards. But really, we should try to tamper that energy for them and say, okay, what do you have a passion for rather than saying, okay, I see you, you come into the classroom, you look like a sports guy, let's push you into sports rather than saying, okay, well, STEM's a really good, good, good avenue to go down. And it also is one of those things that, can motivate you to calm yourself down because you need to actively think in terms of those subjects. So I do think that um, un unintentional bias mm -hmm. is definitely a hindrance when it comes to child's career, career aspirations because it comes from us first. Let's be real, when they come into school, they don't automatically have a idea of what they want. I did, I was like, at seven, I wanted to be a teacher, but that <laughs> but most children will come into school and we need to lead them to where they need to go. We need to give them a broad spectrum of ideas of what they can achieve and say, okay, this is what you can do. And then try to filter it rather than giving them our bias and say, oh, I think you'd be really good at sports. Mm. So that's in their head. We need to give them more of a broad spectrum of what they can do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kalisha. That's interesting. Yeah. In, in addition to, sorry, um, can I jump in? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. In addition to, um, I think Kanisha? Yes, in addition to Kanisha, um, she touched on a very important point. She spoke about school, that we teachers, we, we can sometimes be biased. But just to move a step back and, and look at the school system on its own, I think it, it, it's a massive hindrance to children's career aspirations. Why am I saying that? Because once we, 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 we send our child or our children to school, the first thing that's going to be happening to, like, to them is uh, there's a benchmark test. There's a test, entrance test. Mm -hmm. And what's said about that test is whatever mark that you're going to get from that test, mm -hmm. it's going to be on your forehead and you'll be treated exactly as that number. You will be grouped to say, this is, this child is weak. This child is average. And this child is doing extremely very well. Wherever you go in the school environment, you will be treated exactly like that, by the number. They're going to push you if, if they, um, 
um, so that you are weak, they're going to put you into support. It's, it, it's, they, they say it's a good thing, but personally from where I'm standing, it can mean quite a lot of things. Why am I saying that? Because the other group of children will see you go into support, either in the morning or lunch or break, whenever. And that's a stigma that he or she is struggling. Whilst the other group of people who've got better numbers on the forehead, they go into extra curricular. So already that places children into positions. Therefore, it will influence their future career choices. Those who got beautiful numbers on their foreheads, they'll be going for this big and fancy um, careers. Then others will then go for those careers that are at the bottom, like for instance, teaching. So the entire system is designed into create groups and same groups exist in our larger communities. So it's cool just replicate or reflect what's happening in our communities, that we are in groups. That's why we end up seeing in our actual bigger communities, the very poor people, the middle class, and the very rich people. It doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from our schools. Yeah. I was just touching on the broader aspect of, of this. Yeah. And I want to jump in. I want to agree with him um, wholeheartedly on that because I've seen it in the Caribbean, particularly, um, where the, the school system is set up in such a way that you're right, they do have to write an entrance exam to go to high school. And they are be placed based on their performance, which can be... For children, I remember writing the exam myself when I was, you know, 10 years old. At a 10-year-old, what do you know? And why are you expected to sit and write a three-hour exam that determines your future at that point, you know? And um, so it's not fair. The, the entire exam system, the, the stigma it places on children when they have to go to a prestige school as opposed to a non-prestige school. Here in, you know, I can compare both areas. I can compare the Caribbean and I can compare Canada, right, where I am right now. So Canada does not have that particular kind of system. The children are played, they are zoned according to their schools. However, the systemic racism, racism does exist within the school when it comes to the black children or colored children or BIPOC children, as you want to call them. Um, and what happens in there. So you're right, there are barriers um, for that. And I wanna go to the home a little bit because I always go back to the home because home is where education starts, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And how parents um, view education and for their children. So another question as well um, would be in terms of do we as parent, par do the parents hinder you know, help the, the aspirations of it in the children's careers. And with respect to the black parents, every parent wants their children to be to be the best, to have the best career, to be doctors, to be that's what that's every parent's dream. Is it possible for everyone? No. So again it comes back Debbie to and it's Kanisha. Kanisha is your name? Yes. And, giving them the opportunities to know that there are different things that they can do. And I think parents need to be a part of that and understand that as well. You know, what else can my child do? And I'll give you a personal experience with that. Um, I'm a mother, I have three grown children now, but my old children, like one of them, he went to, to college, here in college from the university. And I helped him select the courses. Because again, parents love to intervene. And parents <laughs> love to have their own ideas on <laughs> what they think the children should be doing. <laughs> and he, he he did, you know, he chose, he got into the courses, everything. And 
after one year decided, oh, that's not what I want to do. I, I blew my top, of course. I was upset because I'm thinking, are you mad? You know, what is wrong with you? Right? This is a prayer you're, you're potentially throwing away. But he had other ideas. And from that experience, I mean, I learned that as a parent, I can't always control what, you know, what I want my children to do, what their careers are going to be. We do have to take into consideration what they want to do, what their skills are, what their abilities are, where, they, where their passion lies. You know, our passion is education. We, went and we began teaching. Their passion might be something completely different to what we, you know, what we are thinking for them. Mm. So a lot of it comes from the home and the whole, uh, the whole concept of what how we view education as parents, or even black parents, what they want, because they know what the experiences might have been, what they don't want for their children, and how they want them to to grow, you know, economically. So yeah, it's a whole a whole lot of things involved, and the school system does have a part to play in how we portray education for colored children in any system, you know, across the world. If I can point out as a help, I think as black educators, because we've usually had experience doing everything. So I've done care, I've worked in Rita, I've done everything. It gives us the knowledge and power to say okay, well, I started in a place that probably wasn't at the top and I've been able to work my way up. Like mm -hmm. I started as a TA and I ended up, I, I took every free course they threw at me to make sure that I could build my knowledge. So it, it as, I think as black educators, because the fight is slightly harder. We knew it's slightly harder to get what we want because as we walk into the room, the first thing they see is black and then everything we present after that is what we present. So we know, we know that it's not the easiest to present well because there's been years and years of stigma that we've had to break down. So on top of that, we, we have that knowledge to say, okay, you don't have to reach for doctor, lawyer, solicitor. We don't have to reach for that. But there are avenues where you can make just as much money and not have to struggle to try and get there and feel like you failed. Yeah. And I think that as, as educators, that's how we help our children aspire to different because we've experienced so many different things in getting to where we are and getting to the success successes that we're in. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for that. I really just, thought to agree with that. Maybe, can I, can I add, please? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Sure, sure. Like adding to what, what the guys have said about parents, um, my experience in, in teaching for 10 years, what I saw was most parents wanted to leave their dreams via the children. Yeah. So as, as a father, I wanted to be a doctor or engineer. And I couldn't, I couldn't. But I love it so much that every penny that I have, I put it together to force my children, to force my children to be doctors, to be engineers. Because I really want to have at least one member of the family as a doctor, as an engineer. So we parents, we live in Adams by our children. Yeah. And why do we do that? Because we, because we don't spend most of our time with our children. And I fully understand, because we as black parents, we have to work three times more to just make end meet and 10 times more to give our children what they need for the future. Yeah. Therefore, we don't have time to spend with them. We push, we're just pushing what we know, what we believe, what we know is the best onto our children. Yeah. And the other thing, coming back to school and, and children and, and homes, just imagine those two you then have something that's called career choice. Personally, I don't like it. I like its understatement. I hate it. We... <laughs> Sorry, guys. Let me just pause a second. Let me just introduce Josephine. Hello, Josephine. Okay, Welcome okay. to the show. 
Can you please introduce yourself? We are looking at to what extent are you a help or a hindrance to your child's aspiration? Looking at it from a parent perspective and an educator perspective. So if you introduce yourself, Josephine, and then, you know, probably just get into it. Um, I want to firstly say good evening. And sorry that I'm coming late. Um, <laughs> I, do, I do sincerely apologize for that. And um, um, so, yeah, my name is Josephine. And what, 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 other, what was the other question? Sorry, Debbie. Um, I was just, can you see the question on your screen? Um, to what extent are you a help or a hindrance to your child's career aspiration as an educator and as a parent? Um, to, to what extent? Um, I don't know. Um, okay, I'm, think about well, it while um, Kamosa finishes what you were saying. Okay, that's fine. Okay. I, I was saying, guys, um, there's something in, in, in secondary school, in, in high school, it's called career choice. Uh, I look at it and I'm like, I don't like it. I, I hate it. Because they then start doing that when children are 16, before 16, about 13. They start to drill children to think small, not, big, not wide enough, but small. That no one just think along engineering, just think along health, not think the possibilities around us. Okay, and then when children are 16, 15, then they have to make a choice. Where do they want to go? I want to be in the health sciences, I want to be a doctor, I want to be, I want to be an engineer. The child is 16, one six, it's a baby. He has no idea of what they put themselves into. That's when we start seeing children after graduations, when they, when they, um, when they, twenty-four. There's there's a whole lot of health issues, mental health issues, because they don't like what they're doing. But my question is, why do we then expect a sixteen-year-old to make that kind of heavy decision, while the forty-year-olds don't know what they're doing? That's why they say life begins at 40. Because now they're starting to wake up. That's, I, I don't want to speak forever. Okay, I'm going to step back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I see that. I see that. Josephine, thank you very much for that. It actually made me actually think, actually, in terms of that. Are you asking me a question? Yes, I was asking you, how do you think... Um... Mike, put the question back on the screen, please. I can't see it. In the back, in the back. Thank you. Right. <laughs> to, what ex... <laughs> to, what extent... <laughs> to what extent are you a help or a hindrance to your children, either as an educator or mm -hmm. as a parent or both? Because it's interesting. Yeah. Um, I was just listening to the gentleman who was speaking. Um, I I am I'm a mom who's very involved in 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 my child's education in terms of um I'm someone I like my child to also make choices and when you say that how do children know <laughs> what you know what their choices are at such young age um that's the society that we live in and um and um I I even from right before you know I've got a 13 year old and I've got a 6 year old even from right, you know, when my, my, my eldest was in primary school, I've been throwing hints about what would you like to be, you know, you know, going to different places, you know, having different family members and different, you know, in different, you know, careers, you know, you know, you know, just just throwing it in there. What what would you like to do? You know, like just wanted to get a feel of, you know, some children would always say, oh, I want to be a doctor. Some children would say, oh, I want to be a nurse. You know, you know what I mean? You know, some, you know, some children have that, you know, you know, that kind of, um, you know, um, a feel of what, you know, what it is that they like doing, you know, based, probably based on, you know, what they watch, because that's the society that we live in. Um, so, so I have, you know, I have been very much um, trying to, um, you know, guide my, you know, my, my eldest most especially now 
on the kind of things that she wants to do. So that's that's how I. So I don't know whether that's an hindrance or that's or, or you know or you know or, or that's a help. But that's what I've been doing because I know the society that we're living. You know, in the very she's currently in year eight, and um, she'll be choosing her subjects very soon. And already, you know, because I've been talking about it, you know, all the time because we've been researching on on different career paths on how to get onto different things and and the kind of things that we want to do and you know what i mean not not and and because the subjects that she, she chooses now some might say it's not a big deal but i want her to get the best experience that she can you know that she can get from now to whatever she is that that she wants to do and if she decides that no it's not for me then she also has that choice i like to give choices i'm always you know i remember when she was going to get to secondary school. Um, I didn't allow her to just choose any random schools. I chose the schools that I wanted her to go to. I gave her all the six choices that I wanted her to go to. Then I asked her, so this is where her choice was now in there. I asked her, you put the numbers how you want to, how, you know, you know, you put the numbers in all these schools, you know, you, you know, your best one and your least best one. So she had a choice in that. But I was the mom who, you know, who was looking at what school is, you know, would be good for her. You know, we were going around checking out schools, but then she was the one who chose the school that she actually wanted to go to. And I had to respect it. Do you know what I mean? You know, but I knew that all the schools that I chose were, were okay. Oh, but, I <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I wouldn't have minded any of the schools that she'd chosen anyway, but maybe I had a favourite. Yes, but she didn't choose my favorite which was okay and I, and I respected it um and it, it, it um you know so in, going back to your question um I don't know I don't know yet whether I'm an hindrance or whether I'm an inspiration to her because she's still quite young we haven't chosen our, our subjects yet um you know we're still looking around um you know in terms of as as an educator um you know um, my students I am someone who you know, because I teach, for, you know, I teach, um, you know, level three, you know, first years, and I teach year twos as well, and I teach your, your you know, your your level one and your level twos. I'm someone who's always making sure that I, I, I always speak about, you know, I always like to get people thinking about what it is they want to do at the end of what it is that they want to do, you know, so I might be someone who's narrowing their choices, I don't know. Uh, because I just feel like the society that we're living, that's what, you know, you can't go around. It's like, I'll give you this analogy. Have you ever walked out of your house not knowing where you're going, where you, you know, where you're going? You, you need to open your door and have it, because the day that I walk out of my house and I don't have a clue where I'm going to, I will be going to every Dick and Harry. I will be, I will, I will be going, I will be going to places that I'm not supposed to be going. So you need to have a vision. I, I'm, I'm of this view. You need to have a vision of where it is that you're going. You need to have a, you know. And sometimes, but just my thing is, don't be rigid. If things need to change, because I can get out there, and and uh, I can get a phone call to say. But at least before I left my house, I had a plan. That's the most important thing. Have a plan. You know, I've, I've, before you leave your house, have a plan to say that, OK, this is where I'm going to. But you might get a phone call with a better opportunity from the one you're going to. So that's now your choice to not make the decision. Oh, do I want to carry on going to the place that I've decided? Or oh, actually, this thing that my friend just called me up about sounds better. Maybe I should go go meet up my friend instead. You know, I'm just using that as an analogy of how I see see life. You know, you need to have a plan. I'm, I'm always someone just have a plan because you can't go around without a plan I, I, that might make me a small-minded person i don't know but that's just how i see it maybe it's because i like things to be in order i like orderliness i like things to just follow but not to say that i'm not able to not to say that i'm not able to um you know to tweak things when when you know when i need to so i don't know based on your question i can't answer that as um, you know, as a mum just yet, because because my child is still very young, and um, I don't know the effect of what I'm doing just yet. I don't know how that's gonna plan out. I'm just I'm just doing things with instincts. Do you know what I mean? And also as an educator, I'm just doing things with what I feel is right. You know, in the, having the you know those children who come across me having their best interest at heart. So I'm I'm someone who just does what I think is right. 
you know, you know what's around me and um, looking for opportunities around me to give it to them whenever I can. So I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. What personal success? Um, so what does personal success look like? What does personal success look like? It looks like whatever you want it to look like. You know, you might be someone who you might be someone who would like five cars. That's your success. Go ahead. You might be someone who actually don't want a car because you're very eco-friendly. You would rather just have a you know a run of bicycles instead rather than having cars. So personal success is whatever it is. I'm I'm really I might like orderliness, but I'm just about I'll go with your flow. I go with whatever it is, but I just always feel like you be the person driving yourself, you know, mm -hmm. and and I will help you in however it is, I can help you both as a parent and also an educator. So personal success is where it, wherever it is, whatever you want it to look like. Thank you very much, Josephine. <laughs> okay, so that question to any one of you who want to answer it. Kalisha, you want to go? Um, to whom? Who? Yeah, who? what does personal success look like to you, to, to your student, to whoever? Okay, so to me, success is when you can come to me and you're proud of what you've done. To me. For okay. them, it's whatever makes them feel like they've, they've done in life what they set out to accomplish. They've mm. done in life that makes them proud of who and what they are doing in their life. So personal mm -hmm. success could be I'm a binman or personal success can be I'm a lawyer. There's no scale for it. It's personal to them, hence personal yeah. success. It's how they feel about what they've accomplished in life. So for mm -hmm. me, that's what personal success looks like, that they mm -hmm. feel proud of what they put out into society, what energy they put out into society that reflects as them as a human being. So I don't think there's a scale of it. It's more of a feeling individually within your student. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any one of you, the other two, anybody? Oh, I can jump, I can talk now. Um, that's really good. I like, I like, I love your explanation on that um, in terms of that personal success. Of course, it's gonna be different to everyone. Um, for me, I see it as, achieving the goals I've set for myself, whether they're small goals or big goals um, over the years. And being comfortable at the end of the day with who I am, and you're right, with what I've accomplished, what I've put out there, what I've contributed to society, um, that makes me comfortable. I can go to bed at night knowing I have no regrets. I am happy with who I am, what I'm doing and achieving. And if I can help other people achieve, then my goal is accomplished. So, yeah, it's all. And that's what I try to teach my kids. And even when I, even the adults that I teach now, you know, they're all going to different jobs right now. They're re, re schooling, which is difficult for an adult at 40, 50 years old, going back to school and learning something completely different. I, when I talk to them daily, is mainly to motivate them and say, listen, and, and empower them that you are going into a next step, but it is not the end of the world, and you will achieve your personal success then by moving forward, by learning. You're just learning every day. That's something new to you. That's, that's success in itself, mm -hmm. learning something new every day. So it's going to be different for everyone. Um, but yeah. It doesn't have to be monetary. It doesn't have to be that you're the richest person in the world. Mm. You know? Yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't have to be that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm also. Debbie, please allow me. I'm gonna I'm gonna run back to the previous question then run. Uh, That's fine. No problem. <laughs> okay. No problem. <Awesome. laughs> <laughs> okay. With the previous question, I think I think I think guys, um, COVID taught us a lot as parents, as teachers, as yeah. communities. Mm. Yep. And what we saw happening, I think it was enlightening and was the start of the greater things. Mm. Why I'm saying this? Because we saw quite a lot of parents taking their children out of school, completely out of school. Why? Because then they realized school is a system that was designed 
to feed the bigger system. Mm. Then they took them out. What did they do with their children? They homeschooled their children. Mm. Meaning what? Meaning that they educated their children. Mm. They did not school their children. Because mm. school is just schooling, a routine. Education is to the soul. Mm. Is to the awareness. Who are you? Mm. And and as 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 communities, as parents, as teachers, we need to put these two guys into escape mm. and see which one's gonna be heavy and which one's gonna be lighter. Education and school should be on scale. I know most of the time they are confused. People think school is education, education is school. They are two completely different people that stand on their own. So if we want to educate our children to the extent that they are aware of themselves, what they want, the future aspirations, then we need to start thinking about education. Okay, I'm going to jump to this one then, and it links to this one. Since we send our children to school, then we're going to start speaking about personal success. When you speak about personal access, um, success, it will then um, put material things along the tag, along the name success. Mm. I, I think it's extremely not so right. But because we're from school, and school exists in a community, there's no way you can go to school and not compare yourself with people that you live with in the society. Mm-hmm. There's, there's no way. As Joss mm-hmm. has said, there's no way. So success for me personally, and I'm teaching that to my five-year-old daughter and my eight-year-old um, son, which is, which is different, and they're in school, is that um, personal success is you are happy, and you're doing what you want. That's it. You're happy, you do what you love. That's it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I'm the only non-parent in <laughs> this discussion. <laughs> so I think what's really important as I'd say the child, from the child's aspect, is never to put failure as a tag to personal success. There's no failure when it comes to making your own goals for yourself. There's always, okay, we can maybe make new avenues, new routes, new journeys, but there's never failure tagged along with personal success. And I think that's really important. Um, Good question, Debbie. Someone in the the chat, someone is asking, um, now what will occur if you are not able to offer advice or intervene? So I'm guessing, you know, in terms of as a parent, if you are not in that position, to give your children the advice that they need in terms of achieving personal success or what you know what that looks like what happens then who do they then turn to you know who's out there to help them see i would say that there's no there's no parent that can't offer advice i think all advice is helpful advice even Mm -hmm. if it's from a non-education standpoint even as a parent, you can go, well, when I was in school, we weren't offered this, this and this. So I think this, this and this would be really helpful for you. Even saying in school, I wasn't pushed to do a language, but now you guys are. And that's really helpful in the, the world that we live in now. Having an additional language automatically gives you um, a step up when it comes to the career market. So I just think as, as, as an adult or as a parent, that none of your advice shouldn't you shouldn't feel like you could offer to your child because mm-hmm. all advice is somewhat helpful and and all intervention is somewhat helpful so even if it's you saying ah uh, i saw your maths work maths isn't your your forte maybe if you i've seen your english work and that's slightly better even that's just from that standpoint i just think any advice that as a parent you can give mm-hmm. is good advice Mm-hmm. Interesting, yeah. And I also feel that, thank you, Kalish. I also feel that if you don't even know the answer, you could actually point them 
in different in direction. Exactly, because there are so much opportunity now. There's so, you know, you go on the internet, you Google, you know, there's so many areas that you could look at that in terms of opportunity to support that child. The organization like the 100, there's, you know, you also have, um, you know, uh, Man Manhood Academy. There's so many different organizations that people could turn to. And as Kalisha said, which I feel is fantastic, that, you know, as a parent, you would give any advice, you know, because you're actually giving them a choice. You know, so they actually see it. Oh, I never thought of it this way, you know. So therefore, there is the opportunity to think of it that way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The next question is, how commonplace is it for black parents to dictate the children's <laughs> chosen career? <laughs> right. Well, that ties in very much to what we were look, what we've been looking at, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, the commonplace in terms of, you know, as parents, how much we are dictating our children's career choices. You know, I was fortunate because my mother never dictated. She said she don't care what you do as long as you're happy. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. And I'm afraid I'm leaving. I'm doing the same thing with my children. I don't care what you do as long as you're happy. If you decide you don't want to go to university, that's fine. You know, it's your choice. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a 90s baby, so I didn't have that free flow. You could do what you like. <laughs> so um, I was. it was more either you're studying, you're contributing, or you're not in my house. That was, <laughs> that was the standpoint when I was growing up. It wasn't so free flow. Oh, you don't need to go to uni. It's fine. You could be a YouTuber. We didn't have that luxury. So um, I think as far as black parents, I think what they want is success. And they want to see success. And I think because they want to see success and and building things that are not quite commonplace in the household is difficult and you don't necessarily see instant gratification. You have that parent like, oh, why are you on your computer all the time? Why are you doing this? And you'll have that frustration because you're you're getting your black parents that maybe not even coming from the UK, that are coming from, from the Caribbean or Africa that is like, hold on, that's not a job. <laughs> Go and get a job that I can see a salary, see a pay slip, and that's your that's choice. Your choice is to go and get a job or go to university, and and that's that's the struggle because a lot of the, the jobs that 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 young people are seeing now aren't necessarily jobs that you need to go to university for. And oh, exactly. jobs you are definitely on your device or on social media, so it mm -hmm. looks like you're not working, but. They're putting a lot of work behind the scenes, but your old school parents won't understand that. So there's a lot of dictate. No, go go and do a STEM project or go and do a go and do a social science or go do something that I can see, that I can tell my 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 social group that my doc my son's a doctor, my doc son's a lawyer. They they need to see the results and it's yeah. really hard to say, yeah, my um my my son or daughter is a social media influencer. What is that? Do you know what I mean? So yeah. And Kanisha, Kanisha is right because it comes down to Can I just can I just pause a little to just introduce oh. Nicole? Oh, my Nicole. Yeah. Hi Nicole, welcome on the show. Hi, thank you so much. I apologize. I'm now finishing up my school here in the, the US. So I have one more student that needs to be picked up, but I have someone watching them. How's it good evening, <laughs> everyone? <laughs> Yeah, okay, okay. We're looking at can you see the question on your screen, Nicole? Yes, I can. How does okay. how, how commonplace is it for black parents to dictate their child's <laughs> chosen career choices? I don't know that it's limited to 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 black families, perhaps black and brown, but I'll 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 jump in in a few. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna jump in back in there. Um so for, for parents, um, black parents, you said brown parents, colored parents, it's going to be social status. And again, I'm, I'm taking it back to the Caribbean because this is where I grew up. I spent many of my years there. And you're, they want to say, okay, my child is this. You're right, my child is a doctor, my child is a lawyer, all right? And that gives them a feeling of, of great status. And in the eyes of their peers and their friends. 
even for family members. When I was um, in high school, I, and yes, children don't know what they want to do at the age of 16 or 15. They don't. But I don't want to negate the parents, um, their role in helping with career choices should be completely, you know, disregarded. Because for me, it worked out. It may not have, but it did. My parents, I didn't want to be a teacher ever because everyone in my family was a teacher. And I figured, you know what? This is not what I want to do. I just want to go the opposite way, right? <laughs> From my grandmother, my grandfather, my sister, my mother, everybody. Is like, nope, this is not what I want. I wanted to do something completely different. And one day I was in high school, it was a sixth form. And my mother applied to the teaching the school board for me to be a teacher. So when she picked me up from school that day, she said, oh, I, I, you know, I applied for this for you, have an interview. And I'm thinking, what? So in, in less than a month, <laughs> I cried. I, I literally cried, okay, because I'm thinking, this is not, why is she making this decision for me? This is not what I want for myself, you know? Um, I did it because it was there. You're pretty much under control of your parents at that time. You don't make those decisions on your own. So I said, okay, fine. I went to the interview. I got the job. And I've been a teacher since I was 17. So, I mean, I grew to love it. But now I've gotten to the age of, way past 40. Um, <laughs> I still teach, but I'm also following other things that I want to do, you know, so it's still in the realm of education, yes, but doing other things that I've found that I'm capable of doing, you know, um, it took me that long, but I can't negate my mother seeing a future for me based on her ideas of this is if you want to be a mother this is a feel of you know work that you should be in right it's best to be a to be a teacher if you want to have a family later on in life that's what she was seeing for me that was her vision you know so she thought if i had gone to any other career i would not have been able to have a family unit of my own that was functional right so i can't negate her aspirations or her chosen career for me at that, you know, at that point in my life. Now, jump a few years later into this lifetime that we have as the society that we have, choosing the careers for our children is obviously not going to work because society has evolved, you know, so much that we can't, it's impossible to do that. Now, there are too many career choices out there. They have the social media influence. You can see what else is out there you know and and make those choices parents still need to be a guide i'd always say that we still need to be that guiding force um not necessarily making the choices for them but guiding them in a way that they will eventually make the right choice for themselves so yeah okay okay thank you very much who else wanted to who wants to jump in come on so um i i totally agree with the guys um, um, for, for me, um, my parents never came in and said, do this, uh, because from my school, from my family, I was the first to complete a metric. I was the first, and even after completing metric, I didn't know what to do. So I had no idea until I got my metric certificate and a teacher said to me, um, I think you should try teaching. There's still application open. That's when I. That's when she told me. So, so nobody pushed everything to me. But, 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 but actually, I agree with the guys um, that you know parents. They, they want proper formal office jobs with certificates for their mm -hmm. children. If you're saying I'm a, I'm a content creator, I'm a YouTuber. I'm a <laughs> Facebook market person. I'm a LinkedIn. Hey, they they not going to understand you like is no. that a job? Is that, is that a real job that you can earn money? But but I'm, just to think about it um, as I'm listening to the guys talking, um, I think they're doing it out of out of good heart mm -hmm. to say, you know what? 
I don't want to have my child. Again, I, I would say it's good heart. It, it can be in two ways. Good heart and 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 boasting. <laughs> a good heart. <laughs> When they when they chilling with their friends at a club or 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 mommy's night, whatever event that they go to, like you know, my my son is starting to be a, a lawyer. So oh, that's amazing. <laughs> but but a, a, a good heart. I mean, I mean, in terms of you know what, I don't want my child to to as as um, a, her name is not yeah, but uh, the lady f- from Caribbean um, Canada, she. She, I think she put it beautifully to say, you know what, I don't want you to, to grow up and, and have nothing in front of you. I want you to have a house. I want you to have a family. I want you to continue with the legacy. So at least I'm going to push you to this corner so you can start. I think that's good heart. And, and again, mm-hmm. it has its own. Yeah, but won't you see that as, thank you, won't you see that as the parents trying to leave their life through the children? Definitely. Definitely. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> you know, because I'm listening to that because I never wanted to become a teacher because like in my family, teachers, doctors, and lawyers, and nurses, and I think, hell no. Hmm. You know, but being in this country, I always say to people that teaching chose me. Because if I was going to choose it, probably I would have been running the other direction. But he chose me, and I must say, I'm in it, and I'm fantastic at it, and I'm loving it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the fact that he chose me actually saw there's some possibility there. You know, because that was never my career choice. My mom was very straightforward. At, at one point, I wanted to be a ballerina. She said, no, darling, you don't have the thighs nor the hips for a ballerina. It can't be that. She was, she was very, very, very clear with the the path in which I could go down (laughs) so I think as far as teaching my mom taught my mom has been in education for about 25 years probably longer than that and um I used to fall asleep in her staff meetings because it was back in the day when you could bring your children into school and no one blocked that I left um and at 17 when I was um removed from my college course she said you're going to Definitely join into an agency and be a TA because you're not sitting at home doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> so that was her choice as well. And then even when I went down my educational route, you're going to do something very, very clear. There's no performing arts, no nonsense like that. You just, you just need to get something that you could put down on an application and someone's going to understand. So um, I think as, as teaching has gone, oh, my little brother's 16 years younger than I am. So he gets the, oh, yes, you can do what you like. You know, nah. you want to <laughs> dance in the street, baby, go dance in the street. She gets the lovely, you can you can follow your dream speech. I didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> but as times have changed and as, as parents have become more knowledgeable about mm-hmm. um, what's out there for your children, he now yeah. gets the, okay, so what do you want to do? He wants to be an architect. And I was like, an architect? Why can't I be an architect? What was that fancy degree? No, <laughs> it's not like constructive. Um, but it, it's definitely with the times you you get the, oh, yes, you can you can do what you like. Um, Debbie has known me since I was young, and, she, and even her style is, oh, you can do what you want now. But when we were like, it was not, you can do what you want. It was definitely go to university, get yourself an education. So her son is definitely benefiting <sighs> from the times changing as well. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Thank you for that, Kanisha. Okay, Josephine and Nicole. Yes. Josephine, did you want to go? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, oh, okay. um, you know, I, I do think, um, you know, this day and age, you can't, you can't leave, um, children to just do what they like, because <laughs> you, you, I, I think it's always good. I think it's always good to streamline what it is that they could do, and I like the fact that um, I can't remember your name. You, you just finished speaking just now. I like the fact that. Like, you know, your mum, you wanted to be a ballerina, but your mum said, no, you're not going to be a ballerina. You know, that's, you know, because your mum could probably see that it's not a way for you to move forward. You, you need parents like that. 
to be able to tell you, you know, I think this day and age sometimes, um, you know, we lack telling our children the truth. It's not about doing what what you want. It's it, you know, it's about it's about doing what you know what you know what is right and and what you know would be good for you. I'm not all about um, you know, I'm not all about getting a job. I'm all about either get a job or be in a business. You know, I'm I'm about both sides. Um, and and you know I'm also quite religious. The devil looks for um, um, you know you know you know like when your hands are idle, the devil will, you know will give you a job to do. You know you cannot be idle because when you're idle, he will he will look for things for you to do. And most likely, when the devil is involved, it will be negative. It will not be good for you. So I'm all about you've got to do something, and it's got to be worth it. You can't be wasting your time because I wasted a lot a lot 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 of my time in my day and I'm not going to have my child waste their time and you know just fritter away and do things that aren't worth it I mean if you tell me you're going to do something if it's if I if I see that what you're going to do it's good and it, it's worth it I was you know I'll be your uber driver that's that's the kind of mom that I am I'll be, I'll be your uber and I, and, and I, will, I will take you around but if it's not worth it, I will tell you, no, you're not doing it. Just like you, you know, your mom told you, no, you're not doing it. Think about something else. And I will give you choices. You know, I said to you earlier on, I'm kind of mom that I will give you choices. I would research with you. I will, I will give you, oh, what about this? Or what about that? And then we'll come up, you know, we will come up with something together. I won't just pluck something out of the air to say, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And that's it. You know, we would, because... No one knows. No one knows the future, and I and I certainly don't know the future. I certainly don't know what's right, what's right, and what's wrong in that in that regards because I don't know what the future holds. Um, but we would research it, and we would try to get the best that we can together. Because I think working together, letting you see what it is you want to do, letting you see how it plans out. I would even pay for residential in that area that you think of to. Give you chances to look at that that area i'm that kind of mom you know i would you know i would i would research with you and then i would you know i would, I would find out you know, whether it's worth it or not and if it's not worth it i'm telling you no you're not doing it think of something else so i'm that kind of mom would so, you yeah. see that as being dictatorship you can, call it, you, can call it, you can call it what you want you can you can give it a name as you like you know it's <laughs> It's 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 all about you know it's all about what's right for you and you've got to know your child as well you know every important you know every child it's they're so different you see my yeah. eldest is so different to my youngest my youngest yeah. I probably can't get away I probably can't get away with that with my youngest but with my eldest I probably could my youngest will probably give me a run from you know she probably give me a run for my money a little bit more and we're probably gonna be fighting a lot more than we would do you know with my um eldest um so you need to know your child you need to know what works for them you know if my child is very good at dancing and i know that oh my goodness she would be really really good at this and then and then she could take it to the top do you know what i'm that kind of mom i will support you to you know to the to the latter i would take you there i'm that kind of mom i'll look for opportunities for you but if i see that you want to dance and you don't even know how to shake you know it's no, you're not going there. <laughs> you know, if you're like, and you're so stiff, and you don't know how to do boom, boom, boom. No, you're not gonna be a dancer. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, thank you. Right, Nicole, you want to address that question too? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, just kind of reflecting on on the conversation that is happening, I. I grew up in a household where I was able to gain exposure to different um, either museums or get an opportunity to go to different marches and, and just really be experienced, um, which helped me to determine what my interests are and where my passions lie. When I went to, I guess you would call it secondary, when I went to college, when I went to university, uh, I, I had different interests, none of which uh, was anything close to being an educator. 
Uh, I was called uh, by God to be an educator. It's not my will at all. It is definitely his will. And I remember sharing that with my mother and she had some some concerns there. She was an educator. Uh, her mother was an educator. They, they come from a very long line of educators, aunts, uncles, but uh, not from the United States. And so just knowing the system um, being very different, knowing that the expectations are very different, there, there was some apprehension there. But again, I grew up in a household that, that stated that whatever it is that you want to do, you put your mind to, you would be able to accomplish it. However, it has to be tied to, you know, something that's going to be a benefit to you. So I, I, I kind of live in the space of, yes, definitely have your passion. If you're serious and you're committed to your passion and it is, going to be beneficial to you and beneficial to others? Yes. However, if, if you're telling me that it is your goal to do something that's going to be detrimental to you or to others, or that's not going to be profitable or as profitable as you think it would be, then there, there's space for us to talk and to have conversation. As it relates to my, my children, going to college and, and university and all that. I, I've been preaching that in their heads from the beginning of time. We've gone on campuses. They know the, the university I went to, their father went to. They, they've been exposed to it. I do recall there was a conversation with one of my sons who said, well, what if I don't want to go to college? And I said, you know, that, that's not something that I ever thought about or considered. However, what I will tell you is that in terms of my decision and choices, I'm willing to support you with your college and with your university experience. If you are choosing something different, which kind of goes back to, to the last person who just spoke, if you decide to choose something else, well, then you're also deciding a different, a different type of support too. So yes, you can continue to live with me. However, you are going to have to be right? Like if, if I am working and I do consider, I know you're not getting a physical paycheck right now when you're going to school, but if you are choosing to not go to school, what you're not going to do is just sit on my house and you're not doing anything. Like that's not an option that you have. So it's either you're going to school or you're going to work. And so if you're going to work, then you are able-bodied citizen and you could pay me rent. Now, I may give you some of the rent back. I don't know, depends on my mood that day, that time, whatever it comes. But that's <laughs> that's that's up to you in terms of the choices and decisions you want to make. Um, so that that's my, my two cents. I don't think that in, in the, the question you asked, is it a dictatorship? when you sit down and have conversation in and, and make the decision with the with your child or do that research with them. I don't think it's a dictatorship because you're engaging them in the conversation. But you do have to make an informed decision as to what you're going to do and really weigh the pros and cons. That's that's just a part of life. So that's my two cents there. Okay, 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 okay. Thank you very much. Anybody else had something to say? Okay. Uh, oh, where's the other question? Oh, okay. How do you support you? Okay, yes. How do you support our children to achieve this career aspiration? How would you support your child to to um to achieve their career aspiration i think i think um what we need to consider as parents can you guys hear me mm -hmm. okay 
I think what we need to not consider, be aware of as parents is um, this career choice thing or aspiration doesn't start when they when they get to secondary school. It starts quite when when they're quite young, like, like at the bottom five, four. That's when it starts. And I think the best support that we can do or we can give our children is to expose them to a whole lot of things at a young age as possible. Like just expose them. So they get to to see almost that world and and then they will drift into the world that that's that's fitting for them. I think that's the best way. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you, Kalisha. Um, so this might be because I'm not a parent and um I've literally decided what I want to do with my life in the last six months. So you know, <laughs> a bit of a different, different take on it. I don't think we can push our agendas on our children from young. I think exposure to everything is really important. My mum let me go to drama classes, I did dance, I I, I did the sea cadets, I, I did everything I said, anything I said to my mum, mum, I want to try this. She said, okay. And it's about exposing our young people to everything. I traveled from like six months old, so I saw the world. I don't think help supporting them achieve their aspirations is, is, is about saying, oh, these are the career options you could possibly go down. No, it's about showing them this is the world. <laughs> this is what you are in. And as far as what you want to do within this world, this is the broad spectrum of things that you can do. And when they take an interest in something, then you can say, okay, so you want to be, say, a content creator. Let's research what you need to do in order to achieve that goal. And I don't think we can support our children in doing what they need to do. One, if we haven't shown them, show them the broad spectrum of things they can do. Mm. And two, without saying, okay, it might not be something that I've thought of as your career path, but mm. Okay, what can we do to support that dream? What can we do to say, okay, you really want to do that? What can I do as a parent mm. or as a person that affects these young people to say, okay, I want to achieve, because yes, not everyone can be the president of the United States or the prime minister, but one of us can. So if, even if you put those, those motivations inside your child and say, this is what you need to do, this is the path of, of that, particular career path and I will help you but you need to have it within yourself I think first exposure just expose your children to everything expose your children to travel even if it's just getting them out their own postcodes because a lot of our kids only see their next door neighbors and their school getting them to see Scotland that's just up the road or Wales and in Ireland getting them to see other people's points of views other other places and a broad spectrum of of different career path because there's some things that are coming out now that I'm like what that's a career it can make you how much and and it's not something that I one was exposed to and now I'm seeing it and I'm like oh I did the wrong thing education does not pay <laughs> but it's something I love I just think yeah just expose your children to everything and latch on to what they feel passion for because passion first is is success so being passionate about what you're doing means that you're going to be successful in it if you don't love what you're doing it's very likely you're going to fail and that's what we want for our children to do we want them to be passionate about the careers they're going into you don't want them to go into careers because it's it's good for them or it's stable and it'll get an income Failure is your most important lesson. And if they have to fail three, four, five, six, seven, eight times, then so be it. But support them in their passions. So like I said, I, I, I decided what I want to do like six months ago and I'm going on 30, so <laughs> give them time. <laughs> okay, thank you. There have been a number of questions in the chat. So let's see if we could put it on screen and probably answer some of those questions because I've just been told that number of questions. So Mike, can you put the questions on please? 
What if your child's vision is greater than yours? Anybody wow. answer that? <laughs> your child's vision will always be greater than yours. Always be, more. Always be greater than yours. That's you true. just have to accept it and, 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 and nurture it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think with that, with that question, sorry, Debbie, um, because we, as a parent, our vision is kind of limited for our children, again, because we want to see them go a specific way. But because they're exposed to what's out there more than probably we are, especially the older, the older parents, all right? Um, not the millennial ones, ones above that, whatever we are. Um, we, they're exposed to the social media, you're right. So they're seeing things like the social content, the content creators, and the, as, as you all mentioned earlier, the different things that are out there for them to do that we never would have experienced for ourselves or even thought of, right? So yes, it's going to be bigger and we have to acknowledge that and support them in any way that we can to, because that's going to be their personal success. If they can achieve their greater vision, that's going to be their personal success. And we have to be there as parents or even educators to help them get to that point. So in any way that we can. Thank you. I do feel that our children and our student vision must be greater than ours. Mm -hmm. Because I've always said to my students, they need to be better than I am. So that's what we need to get them to aspire to. Mm -hmm. And it's important. And we support them on that journey. Yeah. I think we yeah. have the question. Okay. What will occur if you are not able to offer advice or intervention? Okay. Anybody want to answer that? If you could you say it again? Right. What will occur if you are not able to offer advice or intervention to your children? What will occur if you are not able to offer advice or intervention to your children? Well, I mean, I, I think it, it depends. My my question to that is why wouldn't you be able to offer? So I think the the advice is starting with a conversation and starting to unpack the why, right? So for, for every decision that, that my children, oh, I want to be this, so one of my sons says he wants to be an architect, I just ask the question, tell me more about why. Now, I don't know how to be an architect, but I can engage you. I can put your, your thoughts. I can ask you, well, what are you reading what are you looking at what what videos what are, what are you what are your thoughts about being an architect what do you think it means to be an architect i think starting there and then going back to the willingness to do that leg work i think that's another key piece also right are you willing to do the research are you willing to if i go and i get a book from the library and I give it to you and you don't bother to crack the book open, well then how 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 motivated are you to do this work? Do you understand the schooling that's attached to it? So I think those questions, although I may not be able to give you information as it relates to becoming an architect, I could definitely engage you in the thinking process and you use that process for any decision that you make. So, mm -hmm. so I, I would encourage you. Thank you. Good point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, is there any other question? Okay, here's another. For secondary school child, for secondary school child being homeschooled, who is resuming school, who is resuming school year 10 in September? What can I ask the schools on how they can help my son integrate back into school? Okay, so a child who have been homeschooled. How can you ask the child, ask the school to support the child in, in integrating back into the school? I think that's the question. Yeah. Uh, I think most importantly, making sure they get all the content that they may have missed um, and their time away from school. Um, I think making sure that they haven't fallen behind or they're not even too far forward because that can also be a, a hindrance on whether they can reintegrate. I think as as we've got into Zoom and Google Classrooms and all of that, I think it would be helpful if they could say, okay, maybe let's do a Google Meet with your class 
so you can meet some familiar faces because we've got that technology now so it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say okay we're going to do a google meet so they can meet some of their peers so they have a familiar face when they go back uh -huh. to school um and also just having a conversation with their head of year because the head of year will be um the most current in knowing what's going on within the year group they'll know what what your child needs in as in terms of going back in september and they'll also be able to collect all these in, this information for you rather than you go into each individual teacher just go to the year year the head of year and say okay my child's come back in september could you please get me exactly what i need on what he he needs to be up to time up to date with for when he comes back Mm -hmm. Right, thank you. What I would suggest is phase return in terms of um, the fact that the child has been homeschooled for a while. I do feel that the child needs to be phase returned so that it is not too much of a shock to that child the because child. the child was educated by themselves all this time. So therefore, a phase return, I think, would be a good idea. Also, in terms of, I also feel that it should not only be education, we should also look at the mental health of the child going back into the system because that is paramount other than just academic because those are things that we are not as educators taking enough interest in because the mental health is a real big issue and that's something I feel that need to be addressed in terms of finding out where the child is, finding out you know what the issues are in terms of you know the mental health of the child, what the child was affecting the child, and go from there. Anything else? Someone, anybody else want to add? Okay. I, I, well, I was going to to just support that idea as well. In addition to yes, knowing academically where the child is, um, that social emotional, that mental health is something that's showing up in ways that we couldn't fathom. Uh, you have children that's responsible for, uh, and uh, again, I have older students in my building, so they're responsible for their younger siblings, but they have their own instruction to follow with. So overnight you became some sort of a quasi parent, right? The, the parents are off working and so now you have to be responsible in a completely different way that may not be natural for a, a teenager. And so I think that unpacking that also for teenage children, we know that uh, in terms of their growth and development, that they need and they crave the interaction of their peers and they haven't been getting that either. So I, I'm curious to see how we are as a society, but whether you're in the UK or the United States or, or Caribbean or wherever it is that you are, I'm curious to see with this generation and the generation to follow what the impact of COVID-19 and the remote learning will be. But we, we should definitely have a plan in place for supporting the, the social health of our children as they transition back. Thank you very much. I would like to thank everybody for taking the opportunity and accepting the offer to come onto the platform. Can, from all of you, can I have one point which you are going to, you know, which you would actually give parents in terms of either supporting the children or encouraging the children in terms of their education and the way forward? Just one point from everybody, anybody, everybody. Um, I think um, reminding parents that your children are empty vessels that you need to fill with worthwhile and meaningful things. So your child is an empty vessel, fill it with as much as you can, but make it worthwhile and meaningful. Okay, thank you. Who else? Yeah. Um, okay, I'm just going to say that. You want to go ahead first? You go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, just, to, go ahead, um, <laughs> just to empower your children um, to have a voice and to express themselves for their real potential, to be able to understand what their potential is, guide them when you can, give them the opportunities that you can, 
to expose them to developing their own their their potential, right? Towards yeah. their towards their personal success in life. Thank you. Okay. Who else want to go? Josephine? Come on, come on. Okay, go on. Too. I, I would say as as a primary school teacher, I would say to parents, um, um, it's not always about academics at academics, get A, get A's. Um, Please, parents, consider playing. Children need to play. And from <laughs> play, they learn quite a lot. They learn almost entirely everything, be it language, math, um, computers. They, they learn from play. So, so just allow them to play. Thank you. Nicole and Josephine? Um, do you want me to go, Nicole? Do you want to go, Nicole? I'll, I'll go. Thank you, Josephine. So I would say to expose and engage, right? Expose in terms of allowing them and, and providing them with an opportunity to hear and see and experience uh, different walks of life so that they can make an informed decision and, and get to explore themselves uh, to realize what works for them, what they they are gravitating towards, what they may uh, just naturally not be as excited about, because you, you want them to be healthy adults and to be comfortable in their skin. And I would say engage, engage them in a conversation. So not talking at, but talking with, uh, and within reason, right? So not to be used to an extreme, but having a conversation with them, getting them to share their points, their thoughts, their views. And those thoughts and views are going to develop over time and it's going to change and that's okay. Uh, but making sure that you're fostering who they are because they have a very unique uh, project and assignment uh, and, and purpose and will attached to their lives. So I, I believe that our job is to help them get the tools so that they can explore their will and fulfill it while they're here on Earth. Thank you. Okay, Josephine? Yeah, um, I think we pretty much said, um, you know, things that have been in my mind, but um, just to echo as well, um, just being, a, being an inspiration and just, you know, allowing them to be who they are and, and being a guide and um, even if you don't know what it is that you know they want to do, just being able to research it with them, and um, just you know listening to what it is that they want to do, and just being there in supporting them in in whatever they've chosen to do. So just yeah, just being present. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. In the next two weeks, we have our other education talk on the 30th of April. Tomorrow, we also have the president's um, inauguration tomorrow at 7 p.m., the round table. So those are some of the things we are doing at the 100. It's left for me to thank you guys very much. It was a fantastic session, inspirational, education, etc. Thank you guys very, very much. And have a fantastic evening. Take care. You See you guys soon. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. bye. Take care. Pleasure bye. meeting everyone. Bye. 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 bye bye. bye bye. Bye everyone. Why did you come back in? You told me, so I just decided to close off, you know. <laughs> <laughs>